Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here. And that was an a impressive rundown of awards and uh, activities at UH. Um, and uh, I enjoyed visiting there when I came there a few years back. Um, okay, so today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, an event, uh, the Chicxulub Impact, uh, 66 million years ago, um, which is insights to a number of things. Um, you know, it's a, it's a geologic process. It was also a climatic event. Um, it lets us think a bit about uh, geohazards or, or space hazards, and also lets us think a little bit about things like habitability, the origin of life, and where we might, you know, search for life off planet. So there's there's a lot of elements here that'll be fun to talk about. Uh, nobody does something of this scale without a lot of um, partners. Uh, key amongst this is my co-chief scientist for the Expedition 364 that was part of the International Ocean Discovery Program was Joanna Morgan. Um, and, but there was an, another, you know, order, uh, 30 scientists who were directly involved and then, um, another maybe 10 scientists who were, uh, peripherally involved. And then everybody had advisors or students or postdocs that linked to them. So probably our team is now close to 80 people. Um, so I'll be talking about a lot of people's work, uh, including my own. Okay, so uh, impacts. Why do we care about impact cratering as a process? Well, um, I'll, I'll bookend this. First of all, um, early in the, uh, the history of our solar system, uh, there was an event uh, known as the late heavy bombardment that dominantly changed the surfaces of all the inner planets. Um, and you can see that by looking at the record of the moon. Uh, we know about that by looking at some of the record of Mars. And it's expected um, that it probably drastically changed um, what was the surface of the Earth at the time. And that's, you know, 4.1 is a good number, 4.1 billion years ago. Um, whether it ended in 3.8 or a little bit more recently than that is actually still under debate. But, you know, that was a, that was a key point. And what's very interesting is that the onset of tectonics, the onset of, of life as we have a record of it, all kind of came about somewhere in the range at the end of this. And so there's lots of interesting questions about links between impacts and these other more familiar processes. And then the other end of the scale, if you look at the diagram on the right, um, every dot on there is, uh, is an asteroid, basically, or a near-Earth object. And the uh, light blue circle is Earth's orbit. And so you can see all of the red and yellow Earth crossing asteroids that are currently tracked. And there's there's many more than that that are smaller probably. And so it's worth just having some concept about um, energies and, and effects and things like that and thinking about our, if you will, our solar neighborhood a little bit. Okay. Um, now, how does this link to, you know, 66 million years ago on Earth and the extinction of the dinosaurs and all of that? Well, it turns out um, it all comes about as, as a theory that was posed um, now more than 40 years ago. Um, and it was actually posed by sort of two different working groups or two different people almost at the same time. It's one of these wonderful coincidences of, of science that sometimes happens. So on the picture on the left is Walter Alvarez in the blue shirt there um, and his father, Louis Alvarez, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Walter um, is a geoscientist at Berkeley. Um, and they were studying in Gubbio, Italy, um, the Cretaceous, uh, what we now call the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So the rocks down and to the right are all Cretaceous rocks. The fossils in them, you know, were around at the, the age of the dinosaurs, if you will. And the rocks top left um, are in the Paleogene. So that was after the extinction event occurred. And in between, um, they were interested in the fact there was a one centimeter thick uh, layer of clay and wanted to basically try to figure out the rate at which that one centimeter layer of clay was deposited. And so they were looking at cosmogenic um, isotopes and things like that and thinking about how they might measure this. And so they sent it off to a lab. And one of the things they measured were platinum group elements. So platinum, palladium, osmium, and iridium. And surprisingly, they found an enormous spike in the amount of iridium such that it was almost at the same level as the amount of platinum down in the parts per billion level. But normally iridium is vanishingly small relative to the other platinum group elements. And so just from this observation, they made a bunch of calculations about what it would take to have an asteroid large enough to have actually blown up and put dust from the asteroid, which would be rich in iridium around the entire planet. Um, and they came up with a theory, you know, it could be a seven mile or 12 kilometer asteroid to do it. And because it's at the end of the Cretaceous, maybe it caused 
the massive extinction event. So it's a pretty forward thinking theory. And almost at the same time in nature was a paper by Jan Schmidt, who has been doing his PhD work um, in Tunisia and in Caravaca, Spain. And it actually made basically the same observation. And so these two papers together put the theory out there that the uh, extinction event at the 66 million years ago uh, was caused by an asteroid. Um, at the time, however, um, we didn't know where the crater was, which is pretty amazing. Um, let's see. There we go. So what's the theory? Well, the theory is 66 million years ago. We had all of these organisms here on the left, right? So we had the dinosaurs shown in their feathered and bristled form, which they should be. Um, we had the large marine reptiles like the mosasaurs, famous here in Texas, uh, ammonites, uh, and so on. Um, and all of these uh, basically go extinct. In fact, of the foraminifera shown down here, these, this kind of plankton on the bottom right, um, all but four species went extinct during this event. In fact, two of those were evolutionary dead ends. And so all modern planktonic foraminifera arise from just the two that made it through, the two species, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so, you know, evolution of those survivors, including our ancestors, of course, and all the modern birds um, are, are, are present over the last 66 million years. And eventually we get a science party and that allows us to go uh, drill the crater and learn about it. So that's cool. Okay, so what's the evidence now that takes this global event, which is observed at all of these yellow dots, right? All of these places that have that one centimeter thick clay layer that's enriched in iridium and links it back to an impact crater in Mexico. And, um, and this evidence was sort of figured out over the space of, of the next few decades. Um, but in particular, you can tell just by the thickness of the deposit that separates sort of the, the Cretaceous intact rocks from the Paleogene impact rocks, that the event had to have occurred somewhere near the Gulf of Mexico. And that's because you can see that it goes from sort of a centimeter thick to a few centimeters thick such as here off the southeastern United States on the Blake uh, nose is this famous, what they call the blast from the past core that nicely shows, you know, the pre-impact, this, this layer of impact related material, including glass balls and spherules that are literally condensates from the vapor plume that rain down. Uh, and that includes the so-called fireball layer with the dust and some soot. And of course the iridium anomaly before it transcends to an entirely different um, a set of fossils associated with the ocean. And as you get even closer to the Gulf of Mexico, you start seeing these very um, highly energetic units where the spherules are down here at the bottom. It's represented by these little red circles, right? You go through all kinds of landslides and probably tsunami deposits, and then you get, you know, the final fallout material at the top. And if you get really close, like down here in Mexico or in Haiti, it's even more dramatic, you know, huge landslides and things like that. And much of the debates about the stratigraphy of where the impact was actually arise from the complexity of some of these thicker layers, in fact. Um, and so where actually did it turn out to be? Well, it was actually observed back in the 50s and then 60s on uh, gravity data. And so this is a uh, gravity gradient map. So it's like the slope of the gravity field. And you can really easily see beneath the Yucatan Peninsula um, that there is this circular feature in the gravity. And so this is actually the inner ring of the crater. And then here you can see another ring, which turns out to be the peak ring. And I'll talk a lot about that in a few minutes. Um, the other thing you can see is these white dots. These are actually water-filled sinkholes called cenotes. And um, they're kind of random as you go east within the state of the Yucatan or over in Quintana Rojo, where like Cancun is. But right at the crater, they're all nicely lined up right on the inner ring. And that's because the inner ring is made of huge faults that actually allowed the water to create caves um, and then sort of link up these cenotes. So you can literally dive in one. And if you're crazy enough, pop out in another one. I've never done that, but I know people who do. Um, now. What is this feature? Um, well, it turns out that the fact it has this ring here uh, that is known as a peak ring was observed on seismic data. So first in the 1990s and then again in, in, in the mid 2000s, two different big seismic experiments were shot over the crater. And sure enough, they demonstrated the, the, the morphology that's expected for the largest classes of impact craters. Uh, so you can see the big faults that make sort of rings, if you will. You can see this big inner rim here, um, which is what you see in the gravity map right here, um, only see here in the offshore. 
Um, and then as you drop down into the central basin, you can see this funny lumpy looking thing um, at which is this peak ring. And so it's a, it's a lumpy ring of peaks. And this is just a picture from the Schrodinger crater on the dark side of the moon, on the far side near the South Pole, actually. And you can see this ring of mountains that forms around the largest two types of, of impact craters. Um, and so that was a super exciting discovery because it, it, A, placed it in this category of the biggest impact basins, um, but B, it's the only um, intact peak ring, unequivocal peak ring known to be in existence on Earth. Um, whereas if you look off planet, every big crater has one of these things, but on Earth, they're usually eroded away, of course. Okay, so um, this is uh, something we can now do with these geophysics, is that we can actually look in details and map around some of these things and ask some sort of very basic questions, like what kind of specifically crater is it, and what controls um, the impact morphology of the crater and structure of the crater, and what does that tell us potentially about the, the extinction event? Okay, um, and so what it, what it turns out is if you map all of the faults um, outside of this inner rim of the crater, these are these things in white, you can see these circular faults basically, um, and you can also map all the faults within the collapsing part, which is known as the terrace zone, and get a really cool three-dimensional perspective of what this looked like. And this is now just shown over the, the gravity map. And one of the observations that this teaches us is that this is probably what's known as a multi-ring crater, so like Oriental here on the moon, where there's a peak ring. This is Oriental's very lumpy-looking peak ring, and then multiple separate rings as you move away from the crater. So the largest class of impact uh, crater is a multi-ring basin. However, there's also a lot of asymmetry if you look at these different lines. So for instance, this line here is to the northwest. Um, you can see all these nicely uh, clear faults, this big step down into the basin and a very proud peak ring, very high, if you will, off the crater floor. But if we look on this line to the northeast, the peak ring is kind of low and muted. There's still the same faults, but there is no rim, right? The Cretaceous is almost at the seafloor here and it's gone here. And the argument is that the reason for that was probably something to do um, with the pre-existing structure of the Earth where the impact hit. Um, and so in addition to that, we can look down into the subsurface. So by using all these blue dots here, which are seismometers, you make a three-dimensional volume of velocities of the crater, like the, the rock speed, uh, um, sound speed velocities in the rocks of the crater. Um, and we can see a couple of things. First of all, you can see in the gravity here on the, on the top that the central high, right, which is actually an uplifted center of the crater, um, which is expected in the biggest craters, is shifted to the southwest of the center of the crater. Here shown by this red star. Um, and as you look down into the subsurface, you can actually see the uplifted higher velocity lower crust. It's kind of an, a column sitting here, frozen in time in the middle of the crater, starting at about five kilometers and then going all the way down. And it's shifted a bit to the west, right? But if we look all the way down at the mantle, crust mantle boundary at the Moho, and you can see this as a depth anomaly, there's a high here, or you can see it you know, as, as an anomaly relative to, to a mean value, um, you can see that there is a very significant uplifted zone um, but to the northeast. In other words, the, the crust mantle boundary is high to the northeast versus the column of rock that was uplifted is actually high to the southwest. So what does that mean? Well, it turns out when you run uh, models of impact cratering using hydrocode, um, you come up with, um, in order to actually have the uplifted column to the southwest and the uplifted moho, if you will, to the northeast, you have to have a fairly high angle impact from the east-northeast. So in other words, this is supporting the idea that the impact was a 60 degree hit from the east-northeast. So it kind of came in at this kind of an angle. However, the observations we made on the surface where there was no crater rim doesn't have anything to do with this, right? We actually think that's because the original um, uh, seafloor, if you will, that it hit was probably a carbonate ramp. So shallow water to the southwest, deeper water to the northeast, maybe as much as a couple of kilometers. Um, and so actually the Chicxulub crater, after it formed, would have had a gap in the rim. 
because all of this would be made of water. And so that would have just kind of washed away, right, as a tsunami, if you will. And that's really important for the rest of our story because it turns out there's an opening to the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, if you will, um, right after the crater forms. So water can get right back in again. We'll talk about that in a minute. So we learned that there's a role of the trajectory and also a role of the target rocks. All right. So what did we do after this kind of introduction? Well, we went and, uh, and uh, proposed to drill the crater. And actually, we had about 17 years of proposals to ultimately be able to drill the crater. And we finally were funded in 2013. And it was 2016 before we actually got out there to be able to, to, to drill the crater. And if you could only get one site, where would you drill? Well, the community agreed the place to drill is the peak ring. And why? Because um, the peak ring turns out to be the rocks that in the models have actually traveled the farthest during the creation of an impact crater. So we had a few different questions. How are the rocks weakened and how do large impacts basically turn into these big, wide, flat basins, right? Next, why, what caused the environmental changes that ultimately led to 75% of life on Earth going extinct? Um, and what can we learn about the recovery? Um, and then lastly, this is maybe less obvious, but can impacts actually generate habitats um, for chemosynthetic life, somewhat like mid-ocean ridges uh, uh, do today? Um, and so for each of these, I have a single slide just to kind of set up um, the idea of, you know, what's the hypothesis test? Um, the first one is what's a peak ring made of and how do impacts actually fundamentally work? And there were kind of two models that were actually published the year that we drilled. Um, one is a, a model called the nested melt cavity model. And this is an argument that impacts make a really sizable amount of melted rock. So much melted rock that it actually impedes the rebound of the lower uh, crust and mantle. Um, and therefore, a peak ring in this model would actually be caused by the shallow rocks kind of slumping in sideways bumping up against this thick melt sheet and creating a ridge. And so in this model, if you drill the peak ring, it should be made of your sedimentary rocks that buried uh, the, the, rock, the basement rocks in the Yucatan prior to the impact. The alternative is what's called um, a, a standard hydrocode model. So this is basically taking nuclear bomb codes that they just sort of, the, the original codes that simulated nuclear bomb blasts, and you scale it up um, to the scale of, of the energy released by an impact. Um, and if you do that, you actually get a very different picture. You get a huge rebound that occurs way above the, pla the planet's surface, um, and you get some melt, but far less melt in this model. And importantly, the peak ring in this model is actually middle or, or sometimes even lower crustal rocks that have kind of wrapped around and collapsed to become the peak ring. So in this case, if you drill it, it should be basement rocks, something crystalline, right? So we can test that. Okay, next question. Why was this a mass extinction event? Um, well, you know it's a bad day in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a map from a, a, one of my former uh, students' papers, Jason Sanford, which is just showing the landslides caused uh, at the KPG. So this thing used to be called the mid sedimentian Unconformity. Turns out it is the... KPG boundary, and it's super thick throughout the Gulf of Mexico um, in places, you know, a third of a, a, of a, a kilometer thick, right? Um, but that doesn't explain extinction on the other side of the planet. Um, the, the, the existing idea of that is it has to do with the ejecta and the release of volatiles or gases from the impact. And so this is a model showing 6,000 kilometers away in Europe, um, the arrival of the ejecta from the crater, um, where the yellow dots are those uh, condensates, like um, like the spherules, condensates, uh, and the red are um, uh, or the lighter particles. So it could be the dust from the asteroid, it could be released gases, whatever, um, and that the red particles can actually stay up in the atmosphere for quite a long time. So this has been a, a prevailing theory that needs testing, right? Um, and then lastly, you know, impacts might be important for thinking about how life got started on Earth or may get started on another planet. Uh, we know that there's lots of chemosynthetic organisms living in mid-ocean ridges or at hot springs, like this picture I took on vacation at Yellowstone here. Um, but we also know that when we have drilled into the Chesapeake Bay impact crater on Earth, that we saw the, the numbers of, of cells in the rocks 
diminish with depth like you'd expect. But when they got into the impact crater materials, they actually found a higher cell count. And um, the thought is that these might be sort of uh, daughter, daughter cells, if you will, or, or later organisms that evolved from an ecosystem kicked off by the impact crater, in this case, 35 million years ago. Um, so is this, is this a truth that most impact craters, will we find something like that at Chicxulub is one of the questions. Okay, so what do we do? Um, well, we left out of the port of Progresso here, which has the longest pier in the world. It's a six kilometer long pier in order to reach just seven meters or, you know, 23 feet or something like that of water. Um, and, and we uh, sailed what's called a lift boat out 25 kilometers offshore to the peak ring. And so this was our lift boat, the Myrtle. We lifted it off the water 15 meters, about 50 feet in the air. Um, and we worked on this for two months and drilled one hole. So we lived in the, or we worked in the shipping containers. These were all our labs were in here. So it wasn't really glorious accommodation, six to a room and so on. Um, but we got some fantastic results, a near 100% recovery. Um, and then two months later, the cores were sent to Germany and the entire 30 person science party showed up and did all of the core descriptions and the sampling and everything that needed to happen uh, on these cores for an additional month of work or so. In between, we actually sent the cores to Houston, to Weatherford Labs in Houston, um, and medical, did a medical CT uh, to dual energy scan of the cores. So we had 3D images, which was super cool. Uh, and I'm going to now basically walk us down through the cores and basically attempt to test or to answer the three hypotheses and just generally what did we learn. Um, and the first thing is we drilled about 115 meters of uh, sediments. And so this turned out they started at, at the Eocene. So um, our first cores were basically 48 million years old. We started drilling at about 500 meters down and we kept drilling until we hit the impact. And so we drilled through marl stones, clay stones, wacky stone, pack stones, and so on that are all um, within the Eocene, basically. We hit um, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Luckily, between two uh, unconformities, we captured about a 10-centimeter black shale that was the PETM. We also got some uh, uh, hyperthermals higher up in the Eocene as well. And then we had about 10 meters, and that's it, just 10 meters, 30 feet or so, of the Paleocene um, before we hit... Um, the top of impact derived materials. And so this core 40 turned out to be the most famous core, I guess, of this expedition, because this is the top of the so-called boundary cocktail, as Tim Braylauer named it, um, that has all of the impact derived materials from that point down. So I'm going to zoom in on this. Um, so here it is. This is core 40. Um, right at the very top of this brown unit that we called the transition unit that's, uh, that's mostly still a carbonate, um, but totally different than what's above, um, we actually saw some unusual layers, a kind of a green marl, um, and we suspected um, that, that you know, based on doing some uh, micro XRF data and seeing some higher metal contents, we suspected if we were going to find the traces of the asteroid, you know, in, the, in that iridium dust kind of concept, that we should find it here. But we sent, just in case, we sent samples from here and samples from the bottom of this 80 centimeter thick zone um, off to four different labs around the world. Um, and just this year uh, in Science Advances, we published a paper that all four labs agreed that there was the iridium spike up here at the top of the transition unit. Um, you can see it here in iridium. You can also see the nickel. There was also some metals down at the bottom, but no iridium spike. And so the thought is that these are probably hydrally thermally created metals, and this is the actual airfall layer here at the very, very top of all the impact-derived material that probably fell down to the, you know, to the impact site some 20 years or so, or maybe 15 years after the impact. So this is cool because it's a proof positive of the timing of the Chicxulub crater relative to the global boundary, there's sort of no question these two go together um, from a stratigraphic standpoint. Okay, what do we see below that? Well, fascinatingly, as we get down in the base of the transition unit, we found charcoal, right? And then we found this crazy layer that was sand-sized in particles that's all dipping in one direction. Here's the CT scan of it. Um, and when we first saw it, we are like, wow, we're on top of like a 600-meter high peak. How do you get something this high energy on top of that kind of a peak in the middle of a crater? 
And we immediately said, ah, oh, it's got to be the, the returning tsunami uh, coming into the crater. And sure enough, as we did analysis of, the, of this layer, we found biomarkers, particularly perylene, which is a, a fungal uh, degradation of wood that leaves a biomarker. So it wouldn't be local to the marine target. It had to be transported there. And we think it came back in with this, with this tsunami. Um, so that's cool because that's, that's the tsunami returning. And this is a time marker for us. So the top of this is order 20 years after uh, the event, right? The top of this, where this layer is, is probably within a day, right? Because that's the this time for the tsunami to travel. The interior of Mexico and come back would be some number of hours, right? So that means everything below this, which is the next 120 meters of impact-derived material, was deposited in a single day, which is pretty cool. What do you see as you go further down? Well, you see this ever-increasing size of the class or the chunk of rocks within this, this body of, of breccia. Uh, the breccia has, most of the class are made of melt rock, and so this breccia is known as an impact melt-bearing rock or a suavite. Um, and the fact that it's, it's sort of ever-increasing sizes, we could demonstrate both by humans counting the classes and their sizes and also by a machine learning algorithm. And both kind of agreed that, you know, roundness was increasing. It's really well sorted. The class size was increasing. And in effect, this is a deposit that had to be deposited within water, right? So this is, we think basically the crater refilled and all of this rained down in, in, inside a flooded crater. And at the very bottom, we had some very crazy looking rocks with like shattered looking melts and things. And we think that's probably when the water first hit melted rock and had some explosions, so melt water interactions. And then right below that, we actually had impact melt rock itself, which is, uh, it takes 60 gigapascals of pressure to melt a rock, which is amazing. It's like 9.2 million PSI or something like that. It's a number that's really hard to imagine. It's about 10 billion times the energy of the bombs dropped in World War II, billion with a B. Okay, one of the key things in all of these chunks of rocks from the target, we did not find a single evaporite. We know that the targets were about two-thirds limestone and about one-third evaporated ocean sediments, so mostly anhydrite. We didn't find any in the breccias, and so that's a, something we'll return to in a minute. Okay, what's the next thing? Well, as we go down through the melt rock, about 15 meters of it, the next thing we ran into was granite. Right. So already before we even split the cores, just by sectioning them like this, we could see it was granite. And we already started writing our science paper saying, guess what? Those nuclear bomb codes are right. Uh, this is how peak rings form. And that turned out to be a really important result. But you can also see that this granite is a mess. Look at all the visible fractures. We could see at the crystallographic scale, planar deformation features. Um, we could see cataclasites, ultra cataclasites, and even in the pre-impact dikes, we can see shatter cones, which are like runaway earthquake textures in, in the rocks. So these are all signatures of very, very high shock, as you would expect in an impact crater. Um, and it turns out they do incredible things to the uplifted granite. The granite is actually about four kilometers per second instead of the expected six or so, right? It's about 10% porosity instead of expected way less than 1%. The density is about two grams per cc. So this is totally uh, deformed and shocked and kind of helps you think about how the moon can be 13% porosity, right? Because impacts really change the rocks they hit. So that's pretty cool. Um, at the very bottom of this was about an 80 meter thick class rich zone of melt um, that actually we think might be effectively acting like a fault. So all of these results are basically consistent with this movie here, which is again, an, a, a hydro code model of what Chicxulub might have looked like. You can see the giant rebound. Uh, you can see the collapsing outward. And you can see the area colored in blue is effectively what becomes the peak ring. And it originally was sourced down at a depth of maybe 10 kilometers or something like that. And the expected shock levels of that are right about what we saw, something like 20 gigapascals of pressure, which is a lot. Um, so it kind of fits this model. You create the hole, you uplift, you collapse outwards. And because there's no uh, barrier to the ocean, the ocean rushes in on one side and maybe around the edges, um, has meltwater interactions, eventually floods the crater, and then a size sorted layer gets deposited above, above it, which is pretty cool. All in the first day. 
Um, the other things we were able to learn um, was if you actually look at the orientations of the cataclasites and the ultra cataclasites, these 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 faults over these um, deformation features, uh, then you can actually plot them up as to where they they live in orientation within the crater. And it turns out the cataclasites plot in a similar way and were probably formed earlier when the when the thing was expanding. And the ultra cataclysites also plot in a similar way. And we think we're actually probably later as the central uplift was collapsing. So two different sort of generations of, of events. And then, of course, the final thing that happens are actually regular shear faults. And then we think the very final thing that happens is as the peak ring is actually forming and, and effectively thrusting up on top of the collapsing edges of the crater rim, it does so on some really big faults. So we think that 80 meter thick zone of melt probably acted like a shear plane. Um, and so that's pretty cool. In addition, we're able to take these results and kind of expand away from the peak range. So this is work of Gail Christensen just published, where we can actually use full waveform seismic data to get really cool uh, images of the velocities and map things like the melt rock outside the peak ring, the big melt sheet in the middle of the peak ring, and even see some really cool features like upflow zones from the hydrothermal systems probably kicked off um, by the sheer amount of heat and fluids uh, moving around inside the, the crater. Um, and, you know, uh, learn some fundamental things about how thick the, the melt pile is in the crater. Okay, and then, of course, everybody wants to know what, what's the extinction cause and what do we think? Well, obviously, uh, yes, it was it was dramatic, you know, set off probably 92, 10 or 11 earthquakes that caused all these landslides, and tsunamis. The soot is probably generated locally by wildfires cut off by the thermal radiation from the impact that could have lit trees on fire as much as 1500 kilometers away. So that's all a local exciting event. But on the other side of the world, we think the, the, the real killer is what was released in terms of the gases from the crater. So the lack of any uh, anhydrite in the core, these high sulfur rocks, um, in a water target would lead to a, a huge amount of sulfate aerosols. Um, and so, you know, just some modeling using a 60 degree impact argues for something like a release of 325 gigatons of sulfur, uh, also probably 400 gigatons or so of, of carbon dioxide as well. And even if you model with a GCM, a global climate model, just 100 gigatons of sulfur um, with a simulated Cretaceous, um, with the simulated Cretaceous atmosphere, which we don't know very well, of course, um, the argument is you could probably drop temperatures globally after a year by, say, 25 degrees Celsius or so. So most of the world would have gone to freezing for most of the year, effectively crashing photosynthesis, if you will, and being a huge extinction driver. In addition to that, the dust from the carbonate rocks probably also spread around. So it's a model of the dust um, spreading around the world. So you've also blocked photo sunlight with the dust as well as the aerosols. And we even have evidence of black soot um, in the form of these petrogenic burn markers that, that was just studied from sites near the crater and in the crater, arguing that was probably some old carbon in the crater rocks as well that was actually released as soot. Uh, as well. So all of these things go together to effectively block out photosynthesis and cause the extinction, which is exciting. However, life does find a way. Um, turns out if you look in that transition zone, we see survivors, um, uh, you know, uh, um, in this case, nanos um, in, in, these, in these rocks that probably came back in with the ocean. And we even see burrows um, within the uppermost section of this. So just a few years after the impact, we have burrowing organisms in the seafloor. Um, and then if you look at the, um, what was actually living in the, in the oldest part um, of the, the limestones, we actually find evidence for lots of cyanobacteria and other you know, things like algae that basically took over in the crater while uh, for maybe a couple hundred thousand years before things like the plankton really were able to, or the, the, the calcareous plankton were able to kind of reestablish themselves as the dominant form of life in the upper oceans. So that, that's pretty exciting. And then lastly, these, uh, this, I already mentioned these upflow zones. Well, these upflow zones tell you something about this incredible hydrothermal system. And if you look um, at the rocks that we collected, they're full of hydrothermal minerals. These channels of hydrothermal things like analcene and zeolites. There's epidote, uh, there's amethyst that we found inside the granite. So this thing was a super active 
enriched hydrothermal system that at some point probably got habitable. And indeed, if you look at modern cells in the cores, you can see a higher amount of cells down here in the crater rocks than you do even in the limestones uh, above. Um, and so if you then culture those, we were able to get DNA out of three of them, and we found uh, thermophilic life still living in the crater today that we think are descendants of an ecosystem that was kicked off by the impact crater. So, you know, impacts are potentially really important habitats, and that might be important for looking for life on other planets, in fact. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop there and just, you know, leave you with a cartoon mentioning that there are always other ideas out there uh, and take questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm going to kick off the questions. I have a question about survivability of mammals. So you, you, you black out the atmosphere, you drop things by 25 degrees C, and you've got things like squirrels and little monkeys and things that have that get through all that. So how how did they do that without photosynthesis for at least one year? I mean, what are the thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's actually, and, and they're just one of the many examples. Like, so why did turtles make it? This is my favorite one. You know, there's there's a lot of you know interesting ones that that made it, and you wonder why. Well, um, one of the things about the mammals that are have been best studied right at the boundary, um, a lot of them are actually burrowing, and so there's some interesting ideas that that one of the evolutionary strategies may well have been the ability to take shelter. Um, the other interesting thing is pretty much anything larger than about um, 25 kilograms, about 60 pounds or so, went extinct. So there's something to be said for body size and therefore how much you need to eat to survive. And so there's, you know, also things that had low metabolic rates made it through, like the crocodiles. You know, not the biggest ones, but some crocodilians made it through. So, and the sharks made it through. So there's some very interesting, uh, okay. you know, questions about what survived and what didn't. But uh, the ability to, to, to burrow, the ability to have things in seed form when it comes to certain kinds of plants, all of that are probably important uh, tactics for making it through uh, the extinction of that. Okay, great. Yeah. So, Patty, uh, I, should I, do you want me to just go through this? The Q and A is seems to be disabled for me, but I see the uh, chat yeah. box has some questions. Yeah, okay. that would that that would be fine. Um, okay. I've been writing them down. If you can, you see the first one starts from Barbara Hill. Yeah, no, I got. I can just okay. I can work my way. In. Okay, that so would be great, some, Dr. Mann. Yeah. We have some panel are some questions from the audience starting with Barbara Hill asking how far from the impact were tsunamis recorded in the rock record oh that's a great question so they've been modeled to certainly make it to the other side of the Atlantic right which would have been about two-thirds the size it is today right um, but we have uh, definitive tsunamogenic deposits um, throughout the Gulf of Mexico. So there are some that have been uh, observed in Drocor. Um, there is a wonderful place in northern Mexico called La Popa Basin that has some amazing tsunami deposits. Mm -hmm. There was a cool paper just out this year um, in Louisiana using 3D seismic data that argued for mega ripples deposited by the tsunamis at the KPG boundary uh, in what would have been northern Louisiana uh, at the time. Um, and then there are fantastic tsunami deposits um, in uh, the northern portion of Colombia. Uh, and in fact, there's a seismite recently discovered uh, on Gorgonia Island, which is now an island, but at the time was probably a kilometer of water depth. That it, the thought is that it's a, you know, the, earth, the energy from the earthquake arrived and it actually collapsed and there's a wonderful deposit recorded. And then of course, there's this now famous Tanis site in, in um, uh, so, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota boundary, basically, uh, in the Hell's Creek area, um, that it looks like was a local tsunami, probably not from the crater, but from an earthquake that probably caused some local slumping and generated a, a tsunami in that area. And we actually see things like dead sturgeons with spherules in their gills then trapped in the tsunami deposit. So a cool set of overlapping observations. So, yeah. Okay, uh, great. So here's a question from Yuhan. How did you first realize that the peak, how did you first realize, I guess, recognize the peak ring in the seismic profiles? Yeah, so you, that lumpy, you know, it's expected it wouldn't be some very sharp, you know, feature. It's expected it would be something sort of rubbly looking. And so we could see the, the contrast between what was the paleogene and younger sediments with the Cretaceous sediments. 
And then you could see at that, at that floor, that sort of lumpy feature. Um, and immediately when you started mapping it, you saw it on each of the individual locations, you could realize you're mapping something that was circular because we had a, a pretty tight grid of seismic lines. Um, and so that was, uh, yeah, I mean, that was the, the original idea. That must be a peak ring. And the confusion was that if you looked at the densities of that ring, they were low. And so one of the arguments against it being a peak ring was, wait a minute, shouldn't they be high if they're deeply sourced materials? And the answer is, well, they're deeply sourced materials, but they've been through the ringer, so they're actually low density, even though they were high, which is kind of cool. Okay, that, good. Thank you for that. And also, here's one from Nawaz Bookti asking, how did marine life respond to the event? Yeah, great question. So the uh, in if you're in the upper ocean, it was a really, really rough time, right? So most of the planktonic species um, were in the 90 plus percent extinction rate, right? Uh, if you get down to the fishes and some of those things, it's, it's lower, um, but pretty much anything in that upper zone um, was in the 75 plus extinction rates. Amazingly, the benthic creatures, the seafloor creatures were largely unaffected. Uh, and that's because you know, A, they weren't dependent on, on photosynthesis, but also the food source kept coming, which is the things raining down. And one of the questions for a long time has been, you know, well, didn't that get shut off after the extinction? Wasn't there this idea of a strange love ocean? Well, it turns out that's incorrect, right? Um, what took over things like, you know, the, the cyanobacteria still, you know, have a phase where they're raining down a food source to the benthics. And so the seafloor organisms didn't care. They basically didn't notice there was an extinction event. Now, many of them went extinct actually 10 million years later during the Paleocene thermal maximum, but they, they had no problem with Chicxulub. Okay, great. And one final question from Mustafa Sara Budak. Uh, he's asking, were all the dinosaurs killed by the impact? So the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct in the impact. Um, the branch of dinosauria that goes over to, to the birds basically made it through. Um, and effectively, the modern living d dinosaurs, if you will, are the 10,000 species of birds. But it's, it's one branch of that, of that, of that set of uh, evolutionary, um, uh, of, the, of the tree of life, if you will, um, that are the, the avian dinosaurs and the birds. Those guys make it through as our modern birds. But the rest of the, all the non-avian dinosaurs um, were extinct, went extinct. And of course, all the large marine reptiles that many people confused with dinosaurs also went extinct. Okay. And then one, one last question just came in. Are the cores collected during this program still in Germany or have they been moved to the repository at Tamu? Yeah, so um, the of course, it's a great question. It's also one of the q and I see, but uh, the, um, it's a great question. So what happens is cores are actually put in the repository closest to where they were drilled. So because this was uh, drilled in, in Mexico, you know, near the Gulf of Mexico, then indeed after they spent about a year in Germany, the cores have now been moved to Texas A&M. Um, and they are at the, you know, the Gulf Coast uh, core repository as it's known. Okay. Dr. Uh, Mayor, we do have a question on the Q&A. Okay, yeah, and I see that. Ying Sai okay. Zeng's asking, on the planet Mercury, the Caloris impact created fractured surfaces at the antipode. I'm wondering if this impact did the same thing on Earth, considering plates were moving. Where is the antipode at the present yeah. time? I'm probably missing that. That's a, a great idea. It, it can occur on really large impacts where the uh, impact diameter is, you know, a significant fraction of the planet, right? So, for instance, the South Pole Aiken Basin on the moon is absolutely enormous it's thousands of kilometers across right that um that would have created damage uh, um at the north pole effectively of the moon um but at 12 kilometers relative to our you know thousands of kilometer diameter earth right uh Chicxulub is not big enough to have generated an antipodal okay. effect um and the antipode today would be at about 160 degrees not at 180 right because of tectonics but it doesn't matter it wasn't big enough <laughs> so short answer Okay, well, I think we'll wrap it up there. But thank you, Sean. Great talk, great discussion, really interesting work. So uh, everybody, I think, really appreciates you putting this time in to give us this talk. So thank you very Happy much. Happy to do it. Thanks very All much right. for the great questions. All right. Okay, Patty, back to you.